Welcome to tonight's Missing Middle Housing Information Session uh, focused on the history and future of zoning and housing policy. I'm Christian Dorsey, Vice Chair of the County Board, and I'm pleased to host this conversation here tonight. This is the second in a series of three info sessions. These information sessions represent one of the many ways for residents to better understand perspectives that inform the Missing Middle Housing Study and to engage with the County Board as we consider potential zoning changes. For more opportunities to learn and give feedback and to read about previous input and how it's been incorporated over the previous three years of the study, we encourage you to visit the project's webpage. Now, localities around the region and country are exploring how to create more flexibility for expanding housing choice. And increasingly, states and now the federal government, led by the Biden Council of Economic Advisors, are calling for greater housing production to address historic shortages in the housing market. Now, the county board's consideration of changes to our own zoning reflects these national demands, but also must be implemented in a way that is consistent with our local values and needs. My colleagues and I are using the next few months to better understand the challenges and opportunities associated not just with our status quo, but with those possible changes. Now, the most important thing I might start off with tonight is that at this point in the process, the county board has not voted on nor scheduled consideration of any ordinance changes. Our staff is analyzing potential zoning ordinance amendments and will be doing so throughout the fall. And we will learn from both their work, our current conversations with the community, and information sessions like this one as we determine what, if any, policy decisions are made in the coming months. Before we launch into our session tonight, I'd like to provide some history and background on the Missing Middle Housing Study. In 2015, as part of the Affordable Housing Master Plan, the county adopted a policy to explore more housing options within our single household neighborhoods. To implement that policy, the county board requested that the Missing Middle Housing Study be initiated in 2019. Now this study is an element of the land use tools pillar, one of six pillars that are part of the Housing Arlington umbrella and explores if varying housing types could potentially help address Arlington's limited housing supply, the choices that are available to people, and the range of prices that are available to buyers. Now the missing middle housing study began with extensive research on our regional economic conditions the history of housing and zoning in Arlington, as well as our existing land use policies. Then over the past two years, county staff and partners sought feedback from organizations, neighborhoods, and individuals throughout Arlington, and this feedback has shaped the scope, recommendations, and course of the study. Last year, the board asked staff to identify housing forms that if allowed in Arlington could possibly offer alternatives to the predominant five and six bedroom single family homes that are being built when older homes are torn down. And these homes also sell for prices that are out of reach for most households. Now the draft framework offered by staff is intended to offer insights about the possibilities. We learn that if we were to expand housing types, uh, expand the types of housing options that could potentially be built, the cost of these homes would vary based on style, size, location, and other market forces. Our hope for these information sessions is to continue to explore and learn about different aspects of housing, zoning, growth, and related policies as we consider options that might expand the type of housing that's available at different price points that increases opportunities for home ownership for Arlingtonians of all ages. Now this session, is an opportunity for us to explore this in greater depth with our special guest tonight. During this session, we will explore the impacts of past land use and zoning decisions on the housing choices that are available today, both locally and nationally. We'll explore strategies that could expand housing choices beyond the limited options currently permitted in many local zoning districts and land use plans. And we'll explore the impacts of housing choice on a community's racial and socioeconomic composition, as well as the opportunities that exist for mobility. And I suspect we'll explore quite a bit more. Now,
Let me begin with an introduction of our wonderful guest that we have joining us for this conversation this evening. So I think we'll start over here with Marguerite Gooden, who is a lifelong Arlington resident and a retired uh, administrator with Arlington Public oh, Schools, please. having served as an assistant principal as well as a, as a principal of the New Directions program. Marguerite, welcome this evening. Thank you. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Shelley Mastrin, who is a professor at Virginia Tech University. And uh, Dr. Mastrin, you are the author of a, a wonderful, uh, along with some others, I believe some of your My students. My students yeah. were the authors. <laughs> All right, but you, you're the lead author. Uh, you, you get your name in, in front uh, of a wonderful uh, document of the history of zoning in Arlington County and giving us a sense of where we are positioned uh, naturally. And then... We also have Tracy Baynard with McGuire Woods, right? Yes, sir. Uh, and what's your position at McGuire Woods? So Tracy? I am senior vice president, and I work on policy regarding infrastructure, land use, <laughs> and economic development. So as you can see, we have this tremendous uh, group of individuals who are going to help us with this conversation tonight. And before we get started, uh, I'd like to let you all know how you can engage with this conversation. Uh, so we have received some questions in advance from people who have been eager to participate. We thank you for that. But if you're tuning in right now, you can also get in on the conversation by uh, submitting your specific question via text or by calling us at 571-348-3053. So why don't we get right into this conversation? And Tracy, I'd like to start with you. Sure. So, you know, when we think about zoning, uh, people who've looked at a zoning ordinance, no matter what the jurisdiction, will see a lot of uh, letters and numbers and use tables and overlay <laughs> maps and all that sort of stuff. Yes. Let's get beyond that and talk about really what does zoning uh, mean in terms of the, the built environment sure. and the choices that people see in a community today. It's the rules that determine what your neighborhood and your community look like. It determines where housing is where your grocery store is, where your school is, the quality of that school, where you can go for a job, where your doctors is able to practice. It is how a community defines what they want to be and what they want things to look at, how they want to interact with their neighbors and the community at large. And I also like to say it's a set of rules that allows a community to determine its opportunities, and also address its challenges. Indeed. Okay. So with that, uh, you know, Shelley, you have looked at Arlington County specifically and kind of looked at our growth over the years and our evolution and had a, a particular, um, uh, pers you have a particular perspective on not only what we've done, but really how we fare with sort of other communities during a, a similar, similar life cycle. So can you give us a sense of the zoning history, the land use history in Arlington County? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll try to be brief here. <laughs> it's a long topic. Um, well, first of all, Arlington didn't have a zoning ordinance until 1930. And essentially, that ordinance codified the land use that was already in place at that time, which was largely single-family detached white neighborhoods and nearby African-American enclaves, but definitely a segregated environment. Arlington didn't have a plan, a comprehensive plan, until 1961. And that comprehensive plan also pretty much uh, put into place, or co didn't codify, but you know, um, sort of stamped the existing land use pattern in Arlington. So I would mm -hmm. say that, for the most part, Arlington's planning and zoning have been reactive. Mm. And that really goes all the way up until um, you know, past Metro. And not unusual in this country, no. and okay. certainly not in Virginia. Yes, definitely and, not And so taken together, you know, uh, zoning affecting everything that you see in terms of not only what, what is built physically, but the, the choices that you have for healthcare services mm -hmm. and other commercial services and everything else, combined with this history of Arlington uh, sort of codifying what was uh, during the 1930s and then sort of being reactive to that, uh, gives us a sense that really a lot, of, a lot of what we see today has vestiges going back nearly a century ago. Right, and also let me add that although this is not really planning and zoning, I think two other things need to be mentioned. And one is that many of the white neighborhoods had restrictive covenants, uh -huh. excluding African Americans uh -huh. and others, and others. And uh -huh. we had Arlington County in 1938 passed a, a, a ban against row housing. 
because it didn't want to be urban, too urban, which, you know, you could translate that into being something other right. than that. And that wasn't repealed until the late 60s. So there was a ban against having essentially townhouses. So, so th wanna, those were sort of, that re, it kind of reinforced the pattern that had already been established. And, and this is important, Margaret, I want to invite you to this conversation because if you don't mind my saying, uh, I think people should know if they don't know already that you were one of two people to integrate uh, Yorktown High School. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yes. you know, and that was an experience. As a lifelong resident of Arlington County, right. you've had a chance to sort of live the legacy that our two esteemed colleagues are talking about. Um, sort of academically or from an analytical standpoint. This has been your life. Well, actually, the, your explanation has really um, made, uh, uh, cleared up how the three historical, historically black neighborhoods actually um, were established so uh, solidly in Arlington County. And I'm from Halls Hill on the north side, and then there's um, Johnson Hill, Arlington View on the south side, and also um, Green Valley, and it was as a result of the zoning restrictions, Jim Crow. Those were the only three places that um, uh, blacks could even purchase, could live, and as a result, um, growing up in those neighborhoods, we found ourselves, our neighborhoods were pretty um, diverse in terms of economics, in terms of building structures. Um, we had everything because that's the only place we could live. And um, it was that way for, um, you know, decades and decades. And so um, that explains why. And, and it had to do with the zoning. And, you know, it, it seems that uh, this whole, the whole missing middle kind of concept was one that uh, the black neighborhoods had to um, live by, by necessity, mm -hmm. because there was no place else for us to go. So in our neighborhoods, we had single-family homes, we had apartments, duplexes, um, row houses, and as long as we stayed within our plots, um, the, you know, everything, the county was really fine with that. Um, as I shared earlier, we've, we had judges in um, the... Uh, um, the judges in the um, rubbishmen living right next door to, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. right in the same mm -hmm. neighborhood because that's where, that's the only place we could live. And actually, uh, it worked because the community came together and we all looked out for each other. And that's how I grew up. And uh, it was quite an eye opener, you know, when I had to go to Yorktown mm. High School mm. and be the only black in my grade from. Um, sophomore to high school and to see their, that community was so different from the community that I grew up in and came from. And uh, it was, um, it, it offered some challenges. And, um, and I can remember one incident now. Uh, what year was that, by the <laughs> that way? That was in from 1966 to 1969. Mm -hmm. But um, my dad, who was one of the original Station 8 firefighters, uh, in 1960. Uh, four, we had to, we moved from our house um, to, uh, they built another house because my mom had twins and the house was too small. So we bought a piece of land um, across the highway because there were two streets that were still Halls Hill. But, and he built a five bedroom home there, one that, you know, could accommodate us. And I can remember when we moved there, behind us, um, uh, uh, some kids jumped the fence and came over and they knocked on our door, and it, they asked uh, my mom, they thought my mom was the maid, um, because we had a house that was big enough to accommodate all, and it was new, and the, you know, I never forgot things like that, but, um, so we had to live, the housing thing, I liked uh, <laughs> the fact that we had a pretty diverse neighborhood, and we learned to respect each other, mm -hmm. and all the families, and work together, um, as a neighborhood, even though there were uh, the economic statuses were different and there were different types of homes there. So, you know, I, I think the missing middle can work, but it had to work for us mm -hmm. as um, African-Americans because that's all we had. 
and it was a way to keep us uh, in, within our the confines and not integrate into other neighborhoods because of the zoning issues that um, you brought up. And so sometimes I wonder if some of the opposition still is rooted in that concept or... Well, well, let's talk about that, frankly. We're all, yeah, we're all sure. adults here. So, mm -hmm. you know, many of, and Shelley, you mentioned this with the prohibition on row houses, but housing types, at least for some, has been come synonymous with either class or, mm -hmm. or racial status. Right. And so how much does that sort of influence the conversation from you pers your perspective as you think about zoning and land use as a facilitator of or barrier to mobility and opportunity for people? <clears throat> Well, unfortunately, I think a lot of people do consider density to mean mm -hmm. the others are moving in. Right. Whoever the others are. I, agree. I mean, it's just density equals, you know, not us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, true or not, that is that is a very common right. sort of mindset. So not, not, an, not an Arlington thing, not a regional no, thing, no, sort of No, a, no, that's not no, just Arlington. <laughs> no, no. It is definitely nationally. No. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, zoning, you know, zoning can segregate by income. When mm -hmm. you restrict, I, we're, talking about, we're talking housing. When you restrict housing types or restrict the number of housing units, however you want to define that, you're going to increase the value and cost of what housing you have. Mm -hmm. So by restricting where multiple units can go and restricting it to single family, detached housing, mm -hmm which is not evil, I'm not saying that, but if that's, if the majority of your community, and in some of our communities, it's 70% of the residential property is zoned single family detached. Arlington is similar. Oh yeah, yeah. Fair, I mean, yeah. frankly, all of Northern Virginia, right. Right. right? You're basically saying to some people that we're not gonna let you get into certain neighborhoods because you cannot afford right. them. Right. And we can have a long discussion about Historically, why certain you know mm -hmm. well, certain households, certain families, certain people have not been able to acquire wealth enough to afford those mm -hmm. neighborhoods. But 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 that's what you said. You said, I only want this type of housing because I know only certain kind of people can afford it. That has resulted in America in segregating by zoning racially. Mm -hmm. You know because the zoning kept others the others out, mm -hmm. black people, brown mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. um, they're not gonna be in these neighborhoods now because I said no. And before the court struck it down, there was overt racial exclusion zoning. I mean, it said colored Negro no, here, right. whites here. Exactly. Correct. Courts struck that down, but what did not happen, is we always can remember this, while the overtness was struck down, the result of that overtness was never overtly changed mm -hmm goes back to what Shelley said. We are living with zoning that has been there when right. people were explicitly saying, I don't want you in my neighborhood. Right. Mm -hmm. it, and, and the court decisions and the Fair Housing Act fixed a lot of the other things, like you, know, you can't redline, insurance issues, blah, blah, blah. But it didn't, it didn't change or address or look at it, analyze what it was really doing. Let's call it, let's say that. Mm -hmm the underlying zoning which was left as it was and what is happening now across America including Arlington is folks are looking at the zoning that was created and determining okay what impact is that actually having in my community and is it an impact that I want mm -hmm. or do we need to change it okay. and I think that's the crux of a lot of discussions we're all having well, you know, you, you look at this uh, analytically through your, your report on zoning and segregation in, in Virginia. And um, can you just tell us a little bit more about why you, you, you focused on the sure. Commonwealth? Because you've, you've mentioned it a couple of times right, that right. this yeah. is a Virginia thing. Can you just speak a little yeah. bit more about some of the, the, the antecedents of what we're seeing now? So we're a Virginia-based firm, um, and our land use group of attorneys during the summer um, of, of George Floyd's murder and, and the reckoning that we as a, as a country were trying to have, wanted to look at what they did best, what they know, which is land use. And, and we were having a housing crisis, we we're having an affordable housing crisis mm -hmm. in Virginia. And wanted to see if there, you know, what that impact was. 
Um, they read The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, mm -hmm. which is the primer. I mean, if you really want to get the down and dirty of why we're where we are on zoning and housing, read that book. You bet. And they, the history of Virginia, which is you know not great in the past, but we're getting better. But Richmond, for example, was one of the first localities to do zoning. Overtly, mm -hmm. overtly segregist. Like, mm -hmm. you're here, coloreds, blacks here, whites here. Um, a plan, zoning ordinance. The court struck it down about 1917 or so. Buchanan, I think, is the decision. They just were quieter about it. And that's when you got things like redlining, where you got um, covenants in neighborhoods, or, or covenants to deeds, deeds that said you cannot sell your property to a mm -hmm. black person. So, you know, Virginia was at the front of that, along with a few other states, but we came to it early. So, again, it is historical um, and has never, you know, hasn't really been analyzed about what's left of the overtness. It just kind of stayed, and we yeah. haven't really taken a look of what it, it, what it has meant. So um, some of the things that we are, are, are suggesting that localities look at their zoning ordinance and determine if it's one that is restricting um, multiple households living in the same neighborhood. Is it restricting um, the ability of folks to own? I mean, what is it actually doing to your supply? Because again, mm -hmm. this is the supply and demand. Virginia has issued few, less, has almost half building permits for housing since 2004 than it had before. We are a state that is growing and dynamic, which is great, awesome, wonderful. Our housing supply has nowhere in Virginia, but particularly the Urban Crescent, which North Virginia mm -hmm. is part of, has not kept up with housing needs. Households are getting smaller too, mm -hmm. which means you still need more housing units. It's not happening. And a lot of the barrier is that our zoning is so overly focused on single family, detached, and nothing else. Well, in Arlington, Shelley, as you've chronicled, we've accommodated growth through decades with some pretty interesting approaches to, to land use. Can you just a little comment about how Arlington has maybe positioned itself a little bit differently from these trends in terms of accommodating growth, but really with, with not within the, the areas that Tracy's talked about, but you know, in other places like our metro corridors. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, again, Arlington was sort of reactive, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, once metro went in, um, Arlington, the planning and zoning started to change to accommodate greater density in the um, Boston-Roslyn corridor, mm -hmm. in Crystal City. Mm -hmm. So very clearly, those corridors have absorbed a great deal of density. And uh, I also, I, I guess I should also mention that I think Arlington's um, early um, development of garden apartments mm -hmm. um, is noteworthy. I mean, they're way ahead of Fairfax County, for mm -hmm. example, in doing that, accommodating, mm -hmm. say, um, during the 30s mm -hmm. and 40s. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's something worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing, Tracy, um, when you were talking about Virginia as a whole, I have to put a little plug in for my neighborhood, which is uh, Reston, mm -hmm. because Robert E. Simon came in in 1964 mm -hmm. and said, we are going to create greater density here, mm -hmm. and everyone is yeah, welcome. Absolutely. So it's, it's sort of an anomaly, but it's a place that, that has accommodated density right. in a very um, sort of prosperous and happy way. Yeah, it's, it's, there's no question that in a greenfield situation, meaning a place that doesn't have a lot of density or have a lot of development at all, you can plan a mixed income, diverse, wonderful mm -hmm. mixed uses mm -hmm. where grocery and CVS are at the bottom and, you know, has it housing is up a pub and maybe offices above that or have a combination of single family and duplexes and townhouses all within walking distance. You can easily plan for that because you're, it's a, it's a new space. But retrofitting. Retrofitting. Mm -hmm. Woo doggy. That's <laughs> yeah. the hard one. Yeah. That's the hard one. But, but that's uh, what you were describing, ex right? Exactly. <laughs> but one of the issues that I, I actually have been has to do with the A word, affordability. Mm. Because um, although our neighborhood has um, 
uh, is pretty eclectic and has a, a, a variety of housing. Uh, what we have found, especially in the last decade, is that um, when, uh, for instance, we just about three years ago had a piece of property, um, and, and I know the family, they so, sold the property, and they put a duplex on there. And I was like, and I can, you know, it's right across from, I can look over on the next street and, and see the, du and I was like, great, a duplex, a nice duplex. And um, I'm thinking, great, they can put a duplex that's like 600, maybe $700,000. Now, that's still a lot of money, 600. Mm -hmm. And we can, you know, that's affordable. There's two of them. Mm -hmm. No, the duplexes went for $1.1 million each. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, so there, the missing middle is still missing because even though it's a duplex and it took up the, it still was not affordable. And so that's, you know, if we're going to change, have a zoning change and have multi unit housing units, are they going to be affordable? Because if they aren't, we're going to still get the same with thing where black and browns are moved out because they do not have the wealth to come in and purchase and buy a $1.1, $1.2 million home. And that's how my neighborhood has changed from 99% um, black to now we're, I don't even know if we're 20%. Less than 20%, I believe. At we're this less point. than 20%. Yeah. And it's because it was not made affordable. Mm -hmm. And so that's the other piece um, that, um, you know, I, I would like to throw out and question. And let's talk about that, that because we've got a question uh, from one of our residents in Fairlington about how conceptually and under what circumstances could missing middle housing actually be that tool to provide an opportunity for people who are maybe looking to own their first home, particularly, yeah, the starter homes, uh, right. yeah, the starter homes yeah. particularly right. for, for, for black and brown people mm -hmm. who have uh, much significantly lower rates of home ownership. We'll start with Tracy, but I also do want to put a plug in. Richard Rothstein, you name check Richard, a former <laughs> colleague of mine. The, oh, the, color, the color of Law is the wow. book uh, four oh. or five years ago. Hmm. Check it out. So good. All right. Absolutely. <laughs> Required reading. Uh, um, size of unit, number of overall units in the supply are going to be a big, big impact on pricing. Mm -hmm. Because again, affordability is going to mean different things to different people. If you're talking market rate affordable, right, that is anywhere from 60 to 80% of mm -hmm. the average median income. Mm -hmm. Again, people's rules will change, but on average, right, it, it's, it depends. What size are you in? Are you, again, are you building, is it a 2,400 square foot, three bedroom, two and a half bath condo, or is it a thousand bath and a half, mm -hmm. two bedrooms? Mm -hmm. Again, the, 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 the key is variety and options. We lack both mm -hmm. of those. We seem to be as a community mm -hmm. in Virginia, uh, again, is that mm -hmm. you're on one end or the other. Mm -hmm. You are, we have built, I have my numbers down here, we have built like over 60% single family homes. We've built 1.2% of like smaller one to two units. Mm -hmm. Very little multifamily that is like one to four units. T less than 20% multifamily that's five and up. I mean, we just, again, it's called missing middle for a reason. We lack starter homes. A starter home is not 4,600 square feet, kids. Right. It's right. just not. Right. Um, I will retire at some point. I don't need a house as big as the townhouse <laughs> I currently have. Mm -hmm. I love my townhouse, mm -hmm. but that's not what I want when I retire. I'm going to want smaller. Fat chance finding it mm -hmm. that's not a high-rise, mm -hmm. uber lux mm -hmm. condo or apartment building. That's not what I'm looking for. Or can I afford it? I need something in the middle. So I can get out of my house right. and some other family can move into it. Because mm -hmm. that's the other thing. We have very little opportunity for people to move to different types of mm -hmm. housing through their lives, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You have couples, singles, who are holding on to the larger house because they want to stay here in this region, which I want to do. Can't find anything I can afford. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Yep. 
which is oh. well. Thank God I I um, was I'm one of 22 uh, grandchildren, and my grandparents, great grandparents, were some of the um, original uh, freed slaves from the Basil Hall um, area, and so. I can remember my grandfather sitting on the porch with me, and, and, and I'm like 15, 16. I, I loved my granddad, and he was so wise. And he said, keep the land. Don't sell. And you, 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 because there's blood, sweat, and it's so important. Keep the land. Because they own, my grandfather's family owned a lot of the land there in Halls Hill. And I'm the only one of all my cousins and stuff. They all moved because Arlington started to get expensive and they moved out and got bigger homes in Fairfax and out in Herndon and all, all over. Um, and I stayed and I kept my, they teased me, my parents, it was a thousand square foot, mm -hmm. started mm -hmm. home on the land, right back in back of my grandpa, uh, granddad's. And, um, and it was, they called it the little house on the prairie. <laughs> well, thank God I did that because my children to this day and my grandchildren get to go to Arlington schools mm -hmm. and live mm -hmm. here because mm -hmm. I kept the little house on the prairie. Mm -hmm. And um, and 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 so and now my little house on the prairie uh, is worth um, about two hundred thousand dollars more than my sister's five bedroom on a quarter acre of land house out in Herndon. Mm -hmm. And she's mm -hmm. like, "What did we do? We <laughs> left Arlington, you know." But. Um, that's so important. My kids couldn't live here if I didn't, if I wasn't smart enough and wise enough to, um, to, to have that property. And I, that is what has happened to many families, especially families, black families in Arlington. Right. Um, it's mm -hmm. so, um, you know, it's not affordable unless you have been smart about um, keeping the housing. And, um, the, and it starts with the starter houses. And usually if you sell out, developers have come in and taken those original starter homes and they have put up, you know, six and seven, five and six, seven bedroom McMansions. Yeah. And, you know, no, the original folks can't afford to, to buy right. that back. In, in the so, so what you're all describing, it's interesting because these are, you know, many people think of the housing market and, and when the word market is attached to anything, people think, oh, perfect efficiency, rational actors, we get what, what we're <laughs> supposed to get. And yet what you're describing, you know, Marguerite, you know, a, a mismatch, you, you got people who would want to live here but, but can't because right. it's not attainable, not enough supply. Right. Tracy, you're describing the other dimension that you don't have enough product that meets people yeah. at the ages and stages that right, they exactly. desire. Absolutely. Exactly. So how do we, Shelly, how do we get to the place <laughs> where government should think about how to not be reactive and to just sort of accept this market as it is, but maybe are there tools that we can use, perspectives that we can have in order to, to sort of influence outcomes? And you talked a little bit about Rustin, which was sort of an attempt to do that to a degree. Well, I think, again, I think <coughs> the effort to, to change the single-family detached zoning and allow for at least, at, at least allow for opportunities of more housing on those properties, um, whether it's duplex, triplex, or mm -hmm. quadruplex, or whatever, however, up to eight, I guess, is perhaps considered. Um, at least that's an opportunity for there to be more affordable housing. I mean, if you think of the cost of a s one single family home and divide that by four, mm -hmm. right. for four units, I mean, I'm not saying that that's necessarily how it would work, would work out in the market, but it could, right. it could. Mm -hmm. It's a but potential, like to see happen. certainly a potential. Yeah, as long as the size right. is, as long, is reduced, exactly. right? right. right. Yeah. I mean, again, this, this is being, you know, you have the discussion about the context of where you're putting the units, right. or the unit in this case. It, in this case, we're talking about single-family neighborhoods. If the volume is similar, and the only thing that has changed, and I've seen designs where you wouldn't even know this, that there's a four, or there's two, or there's six inside, then you are creating, within the same volume, multiple dwelling units for multiple families and households, which Again, supply and demand is pretty simple. We all understand that. We're all smart people. More supply to meet your demand. And I think it's, the, it's a discussion of, in Arlington of 
it's not, a, I hate to say this, but it's not accommodating future growth. It's accommodating people who are currently here. It is whether you're about to graduate from college, son and daughter, could come back home and find mm -hmm. a place to live, to, right. to buy a rent. It's whether your um, <clears throat> firefighter, who may be an entry level, mm -hmm. can he or she mm -hmm. live in the neighborhood that they exactly. serve. Don't get me started on teachers and healthcare. Absolutely. I mean, all of these people are what makes our community wonderful, right. provide the things that we care about. And I know of a local planning department whose planning staff cannot afford to live in the community. That seems a little weird to me. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and I think you, you, hit, you have hit, right, um, um, hit the nail on the head in terms of it, what she just described is Arlington. This is exactly, I mean, um, teachers, uh, firefighters, uh, first responders. I, I've just had this conversation with my neighbor who, um, is renting her house, and she says, I want to rent it. She has rented it to uh, four people in the past, and um, she says, I really want to rent it to teachers, young teachers, or firefighters, or, um, and uh, because I know they can't afford sure. to, to come and live here, and that is really, uh, that's a shame, because when I came out of school, I came back here to Arlington because I could live here and work here, and but um, you know, and and my daughter works for the court system, and if I didn't own, she wouldn't be able to afford to live and work in this in in, mm -hmm. in this county, um, and that needs to change. Definitely mm. needs to change. So we've got a question, and this is one of the things that is is. Uh, frequently brought up in this conversation because one of the things that zoning is 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 supposed to do generally speaking is to you know sort of match uses uh, with with infrastructure and, mm -hmm. and amenities that are available to make sure that there's harmony and so um, you know the question is really about whether missing middle uh, should be located in com in parts of the community that are not for example metro accessible or that aren't convenient walkable i'm presuming to shopping and commercial activities so you know what about areas that are you know, mm -hmm. really entirely far removed from from any of those amenities and uh and what are, what are your thoughts there? Well, I, I think one of the great trends that we've seen over the last 20 years is mixed-use development. Redevelopment in Arlington and every place else in, in, that we know of around here has provided multiple uses in the same place or near the same place because that's what we as consumers have decided we want. Mark, you know, in the way market. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, I want a, I want restaurant that I can walk to. Mm -hmm. I want mm -hmm. a little bit of shopping, not a ton of shopping. I'm not looking for their, necessarily a mall, but I want some shopping near me. So I, I, I think, um, particularly in a community like like Arlington, because of its size, its robust investment in transit that is not all about metro. There's mm -hmm. your bus. Mm -hmm. There's your I, I guess it's mm -hmm. called Transit Way or BRT. You know, mm -hmm. you, you know, mm -hmm. um, you have non-single occupancy vehicle opportunities that are flexible. Metro love it, but it's not the most flexible mm -hmm. system on the mm -hmm. planet. Mm -hmm. Your bus system, your transit way, y'all have the ability to reconfigure that based on demand. So a mixed income, a, a new mixed income neighborhood or neighborhood that is evolving to be mixed income, for that, for environmental reasons, for clean air reasons, for health reasons, you, you can provide transit in a way that those people who live there may not always have to use a single or be a single occupant in a vehicle and drive someplace. Yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, housing needs to be everywhere. And I think, you know, that's one of the things we're talking about. But I think um, putting as much density of multiple uses near... Tr transportation or transit nodes absolutely is a good idea, mm -hmm. but it shouldn't preclude you from doing other housing elsewhere that may not be as transit oriented. You know, I, I, in listening to your explanation, I'm thinking South Arlington mm -hmm. has done, south of Route 50, they have done a better job um, organically of 
addressing these issues with housing, transit, I mean, you know, with the whole Columbia Pike mm -hmm. reefer. Mm -hmm. It's really far north of um, 50, really north of Langston Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's just get real. Mm -hmm. It is that because South Arlington, they're working on it. They're doing it. And, and I, I have a lot of young people that I know would prefer to live there on the south side mm -hmm. um, than on the north mm -hmm. side because diversity, density, the, all, all of the opportunities, the transportation, it's, you can, you know, all, all of the businesses that have, have come there, they're doing a better job than... Well, um, I'm a South Arlington resident, so I'm going to have to let that comment go without, okay. without comment because, you know, well, I, I am know elected. Job, I am elected. I've said it. I've said one more thing about course, that. Well, just course. to add on to what you both said, it seems to me that it perhaps the market will also um, um, work so that some of the more remote areas will not be developed more densely in the short term. Right, in other right. words, you know, um, the demand for... Uh, more dense housing may happen, may may occur in places that are much more transit oriented, at mm -hmm. least initially. Mm -hmm. Initially, mm -hmm. yeah. so, yeah. and that's sort of the good point. Uh, you your your zoning changes do not change anything overnight. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> right. Lord, no, that does not happen. Um, it will happen over time. So what you do with zoning is you identify what you want to see, where you want the change to happen, and the kind of change you want. Mm. You're not saying this is happening tomorrow, because that's not how the world works. Yeah, it takes a long time to go through the process of, of, yeah. of absorbing what, what a zoning ordinance might mean in yes. terms of an opportunity. Right. If you're a developer, to going through the process yeah. of doing it. Right. And yeah, these are, these are generational in right. terms right. of, yeah. of yeah. what Absolutely. Yeah. But I would like for the county, if this is, I would like for um, it, it to be, the, the county to be mindful and, and protect, especially the historical black neighborhoods who have been absorbing a lot of, a lot of the changes in um, the, the redevelopment and the, I feel like sometimes the exportation of, of um, the um, developers coming in mm -hmm. and taking over. If the county can protect and preserve some uh, some of the, some of our neighborhoods from being um, targeted and over over um, um, the, the missing middle over implement, implemented in um, in those neighborhoods and I understand it's going to take a long time but I just worry about our neighborhood being the number one target and developers coming in and just exploiting us even more than we have been. And we're becoming even more dense because we're the only place that, you yeah. know. The that, concern that, that this becomes where a, where a profit can be made exactly, so people targeted exactly, for intense exactly. action. Exactly, and, uh, and I see that, and maybe it's just me, but I see it, it has historically happened. And again, I'm, I'm going to focus on the three historical black neighborhoods. And I just want us to be mindful mm -hmm. of that. And I, I, you know, um, so... That's but no, but this is this is perfect because one of the things that we're trying to do is is to have different people who may come into this conversation differently to think about all the perspectives mm -hmm. that are here because it's a big issue. It's a broad yeah. issue. And if we're honest, none of us knows um, right. if we were to pursue these zoning changes, none of us can say with any degree of absolute certainty exactly what <laughs> would happen right. when, right? So part of what we're trying to do is to figure out what needs to work best for Arlington. But I do want to talk about this because we, you know, we talked about density and, and really at the top talked about density being alarming to many right. people. And um, I just want to get your perspectives because as we think about missing middle, at least as it's been framed in, in the Arlington context, um, and, and hearkening back to how zoning works, mm -hmm. uh, these neighborhoods would still be low density like these are still yeah. low density zoning categories they're Absolutely. going from yes. you know one unit per lot to potentially right. you know some other more but still falling within the you know fewer than 10 units an acre kind of situation exactly. right yeah. so yeah i mean i think it's it's for and again there are you all and your staff have provided examples um, the city of Norfolk has done some modeling also. They've done sort of, well, if you did, it would look like this. 
the key would be that you're looking to keep the, like I said, the density in terms of the volume of each building. Mm -hmm. Single family home is a mm -hmm. building, a duplex is a building, mm -hmm. a quadplex is a building. They're all still going to be the same similar, I guess scale would be another mm -hmm. way to think about it. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. scale will stay the same. The only diff, again, all I say is the only difference is how many households fit in the volume of that right. building. And so, um, you know, that, people, uh, you know, try to think of it that way. Try to think of it as um, the volume stays the same. The, all it changes is how many mm -hmm. households are actually inside the shell. And I think, I think just to be, again, you're mm -hmm. not looking at the Rosalind Boston corridor. That is not. Right. what anyone talks about in Missing Middle, nor should you. Right. You're literally talking about a size and volume and type of, of housing unit that for a variety of reasons just does not exist in this community in Arlington. And it means that you have artificially, I'm just going to put it that way, because mm -hmm. you don't allow it, you have artificially limited housing options for current and future residents. Now let's get off my soapbox that's okay. <laughs> I'm going to move to another question uh, that's come in from a viewer. Can you speak a little bit about whether or not uh, or what the impact is of doing zoning changes like the kind we're proposing comprehensively versus more sp site specific mm -hmm. zoning or using mm -hmm. special exception or other review processes to permit activities? Can you just give us a sense of what you think of it? Well, <laughs> I like it, but I. I like it. <laughs> Let's get all right, perspectives right, on the right, table well, here. All right, well, just my gut reaction is that I think that if you're going to make this kind of change, it should be equitable, mm -hmm. which means I think it should be blanket across all single-family detached zones, not, um, well, not, not isolated at all. And I'm, I'm not even sure that special exception is the way to go. I mm -hmm. just think if you're going to make this kind of change, make it across every, all, all zones that are single-family detached. Okay, so an equitable consideration yeah, through comprehensive I, 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 approaches. Comprehensive sure. approach, I yes. think, all hands on deck, mm -hmm. meaning you have it everywhere. Yes, there may be some context things based on environmental issues or mm -hmm. or or parking or for parking example. or mm -hmm. or parks even mm -hmm. that you might tweak things in broad, mm -hmm. not site by site, but broad perspective. Mm -hmm. But if you're, again, zoning is meant to be the rules of the road for everybody. You know going in what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. Having a small, picayune, plot by plot decision is just going to drive everybody crazy. And if your goal is to increase housing options, you are not creating a market where that will happen. I'm just going to be real about it. Okay. Um, a non-profit, non -profit, for-profit, neutral profit not going to touch you with a 10-foot pole. They're just not. They want consistency. They want predictability. My favorite word, <laughs> equitable. <laughs> equity. Equitable distribution mm -hmm. of the implementation mm -hmm. of a mi missing middle um, uh, policy or program. Zoning, uh, I I'm with you 100%. I agree that it should be across the board. If, it if it's going to happen, it has to be the same everywhere for everyone. And... Um, well, it's the, it's the responsibility of the local government to uh, make sure that you think about specific contexts within your ordinance itself. Mm -hmm. You draft your, your ordinance to uh, account for mm -hmm. those uh, specific variations yeah. that you're concerned mm -hmm. with, and you accommodate that within your, audi your ordinance if you do it well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also the responsibility, I would think, of, of the local community that if there are uh, known consequences that you... You, you mitigate them broadly instead yes. of right. reviewing yeah. them right. side by yeah. side. You're you treating know. everybody right. the same, right. fairly, equally. Not right. the same, but yeah. no right. equity. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. No, yeah. it's, it's, it's very, uh, it's, it's fascinating. So we've got another question that I want to get to. Um, lot size requirements influencing housing and what is built. And Tracy, this is going back to the conversation earlier about, I think, uh, you know, the market such as it is. The one thing that is predictable, pricing is sort of based <laughs> on, like size, size and what you get, and right? scarcity, and you know, what you can do with it. It's not duplex is going to cost one point X million. It's right. it's a it's a one thousand square foot duplex is going to cost a lot less then, than a twenty five hundred right, square right. foot duplex, right? Yeah, ex exactly. So you 
you you do and again i think with what you want to do you want to give the market an opportunity to meet a variety of demands so um being able to say yep we can make four 1000 square foot foot units in a building work mm -hmm. you know that that's a great thing works for it let's get it done if you want to do two that are 2,500, I don't love it, but that makes sense too. If you want to do six that are 1,000 each, I just, again, I think it is allowing the market to appeal to different customers. I mean, that's another way to put about it, mm -hmm. to think about it. And making it affordable. Yeah. So, well, let's think about affordable because that's really been, I think, if, yes. if there is one thing that has united people in this community conversation, at least the ones that I've had, are people who uh, want to see that there be more attainable right. options. I'll, yeah. I'll use the word attainable, attainable for this yeah, a conversation. I, 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 um, and, and people being concerned that what's being proposed won't deliver on that, that right. it will continue right. to deliver yes, units concern. that are Insane. available for people, mm -hmm. if not at the, uh, you know, the high end of the single mm -hmm. dwelling mm -hmm. market, mm -hmm. still, far mm -hmm. beyond what would be attainable for most households. So, um, you know, talk about that for a second. Hmm. We've talked about size. Are there any other uh, things that we can think I, of yeah. that could help us ensure that attainability right. is a feature and not a, a, a lost? Right, I think you have to be realistic about the costs that go into creating a unit mm -hmm. or creating housing. There's materials, value of the land, um, time from permitting to letting someone move in, um, what you have to do to accommodate, and again, it depends on what, whether it's parking. I mean, the bottom line is those are, those are cost matters. And so determining how you balance the, I want these certain amenities, but I also want it to be within a certain price point, you have to have a realistic discussion with the builder. You, you just do. Mm. And if there's a price point you can't get to from market, this is where the public entity, local government, will determine what is the best use of additional tools and money that I bring to the table to achieve a certain price point. So ideally, there's purely market rate housing at a variety, less than a million dollar mm -hmm. price point you can get to without much beyond processing it as quickly as you can, not overburdening it with, with, some, with some of the regulations around parking or whatever. Um, on the other hand, if you want to get to 30, 50, 40, mm. somewhat mm -hmm. market-ish rate, mm -hmm. you as a government may have to decide that we will allow less parking because there's a lot more transit or whatever you might have to do, putting in cash, helping them get a loan, right. using LIHTC right. a lot more, um, helping them go to the Virginia Housing Commission or mm -hmm. Authority and getting loans and mm -hmm. credit, whatever you can do, you know, hopefully there's going to be new federal money coming out of the IRA mm -hmm. that'll be available to, to help localities do the two things they need to do for attainable housing, preservation of existing and providing that extra little financial oomph that um, gets it to a price point you want. What's nice is you're likely with your, with local government public monies going in, probably have a much more control of how long that stays attainable because that has been a bit of a challenge that units can start out attainable, but over time values increase. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they may get themselves priced out of the original sort of target incomes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my theory is do what you can, get what you can through purely market rate mm -hmm. with little or no, with no, frankly, financial assistance from mm -hmm. government so that y'all can, can use what resources you have to get the other level that it's hard to do at a market rate. And I just gotcha. think we just, it's just realistic you know, how, how that works. Gotcha, yeah. So, you know, we've talked about missing middle and, and I, you know, forgive us in Arlington, we've, we've talked about this as if, you know, this is this original <laughs> conversation, but you know, as you have mentioned in the way that your community has developed or mm -hmm. if anybody who actually 
looks outside of their homes in, in many Arlington communities, <laughs> they will see missing middle housing types that exist currently. Yes. And we also know throughout the country, right. we, we have lots of neighborhoods, well-known, vibrant, mm -hmm. uh, all parts of the country where different housing types mm -hmm. are a part of the scenario. So can we just talk a little bit about this? Like, wh where, where did we kind of get in this national conversation that somehow the single dwelling per lot mm. was the, the normative standard that yeah. sort of drives a lot of thinking. I would refer people to the book. Um, one of my colleagues, Sonia Hurt, has written a book called Zoning in the USA. Okay. And mm. it's, a, it's a fascinating um, look at how America is so different from almost any other country in the world mm. in having dominant single-family detached mm. housing mm. as mm -hmm. the norm. Mm. And it's been, we've, we've you know, coming to the mm -hmm. U. I mean, coming to um, America from Europe, uh, the, the sort of notion mm -hmm. of having a, an estate, right. you know, <laughs> an, an, an independent estate. You know, mm -hmm. that 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 pattern was started long, long, long ago, and it's just been perpetuated over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, you know, the first settlers on Jamestown had detached houses. Okay. They weren't, I mean, they didn't come from that. Cause if, again, if you've, see, you've seen in a book, seen right. in a movie, been to London or any other place yeah. in Europe, you know, yeah. they're close Absolutely. together. Yeah. They live. Absolutely. She, that's how cities were built. That's how cities were built. Darn. And, um, yeah. Well, I have a question. You know, I'm, I'm a senior citizen. I've been around and, uh, seven plus decades, <laughs> but anyway, the younger people, and I think of my kids, mm -hmm. and uh, our discussion about missing middle, very different um, than the discussions I have with other senior folks, because young people are ready for the density, are, are, are ready for a community that looks more like, and I have traveled in Europe, and you are exactly right, and it's like, you know, flats, and mm -hmm. what, I mean, that's yeah. like, hey, and they um, uh, are used to, they prefer that kind of, because yeah. of the socialization yeah. that they have. Um, okay. And, um, but we go back to affordability um, or attainability mm -hmm. um, in that the average income in Arlington, I mean, this blows my mind being a native, is uh, the average household in income is $110,000. Yeah. Well, my, both of my kids are college graduates and are professionals, and they barely, I mean, neither one of them are making six figures mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. So it's like if we want our teachers and firefighters mm -hmm. and um, police officers and stuff to live in this, in, in our community, even in a dense, sure. populated um, area, we better be looking at salaries or some kind of way helping them financially to acquire units yeah. in, yeah. in yeah. housing. Yeah. And that's part a big yeah. part of missing middle. It's like, you know, even if we, like in Europe, if, if we had more um, multi-family mm -hmm. dwellings, could they really afford to come here and, and work here and, and live right. in them? Mm -hmm. So... So I'm going to go to you, our retired educator, a little bit. Um, and so let's talk about how this um, could affect school diversity. So just for, for context speaking, because I want to invite Shelley and Tracy to join this conversation as well, uh, the area that Marguerite was talking about earlier north of Lee Highway mm -hmm. has some of our uh, most uh, homogenous schools in the county, Absolutely. having uh, uh, quite the large uh, white population far disproportionate than the overall white population. Gotcha. So uh, that's like the ninety eight percent, ninety nine percent of the schools, elementary <coughs> and uh, middle schools are. And and it, I remember speaking at a school board meeting some years ago when they were doing um, redistricting rezoning mm -hmm. because my neighborhood um, was um, has always been. And, and again, I'm going to go back to the historical black neighborhoods have always been the target for um, because we were diverse uh, in zoning for schools to try to integrate and diverse diversify the school setting. And my mm -hmm. neighborhood has been split up, was split up so that you could 
they could have more diversity at Yorktown, Williamsburg, sure. and some of the other elementary hmm. schools. And that was not fair to our kids because their kids got to go to their neighborhood schools and, you know, right there in the community. And it's like 98 percent because your community, and I said this at the school board, this whole um, uh, rezoning really has to do with the neighborhood di demographics. Because you're, you're going to get boundary changes that you were, boundary yeah, changes, yeah, right. yeah, right. yeah, and because you're going to get you you'll get diversity in the schools when your neighborhoods choose to become diverse, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. and that and so let's 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 be honest and let's just live with it. Leave my neighborhood alone. The people that live in my neighborhood they move there, especially white people, because they want to be in a diverse neighborhood. Right. I, I great. I have great. Um, rapport with the neighbors and our, our elementary school is diverse. Um, and that's what they want. That's why they chose to move there. So don't split up our neighborhood because some other neighborhoods have chosen not to have their, their housing and neighborhoods be more diverse. Don't hurt us. You know, let our kids stay mm -hmm. together and, and all go to the same uh, elementary school into the same um, middle schools, you know, right. and and high school, and so um, that's so, how I got that. That's how I got to be the only only five blacks in, in Yorktown back in 1966 to 1969 because they only took two streets of my neighborhood, you know, because mm -hmm. so they had to. Um, yeah. And uh, and then the rest of the kids in my neighborhood all went to Washington. WNL, I'll say <laughs> back then, but that kind of stuff was still it yeah. was still happening, and we have to diversity is going to come as a result of housing, mixed income, yeah, mixed yeah. It, absolutely, yeah. it'll be absolutely. organic, it'll happen, and yeah. there's nothing absolutely. wrong with it. Absolutely, and uh, <laughs> we just need to live with this. That north of you're going to have elementary, middle, and in high schools that are 99, 98, 97 white. Because that's what the neighborhood looks like. So what I'm hearing is uh, not rocket science here. You know, if you're going to be a community that values sort of uh, having kids uh, be able to walk to schools yeah. that may be in their neighborhood, yep. the, the way to create diversity is to have diverse, more diverse, diverse families housing. living in, in those, those places. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's that's connect the dots on that, right? Yeah. That's <laughs> I mean, a no. equals B. <laughs> Just say I it. mean, that's for real. Uh, and and you, right. that's, that's not getting right. defensive about it. It's what it happen. is for real. Yeah. It's, that's, that's how it is. And so I think, um, you know, this whole, I really think some of, you know, people are struggling with the missing middle because they're struggling just with how they really feel about what may happen to their neighborhoods. And so they have to come to grips with and just be honest. We like how things are, and so, um, you know, they feel threatened by this missing middle because it seems like it's, you're going to shove diversity, they associate it with the D word, diversity, down their throats. And that's not what, that's not what I'm hearing from the conversations that I've heard. It's the possibility would be become, right. would, would, would yeah. become uh, available for it to happen, and that is scary to yeah. some folks that kind of like their neighborhoods, how the, you know the way it is. People are afraid of change. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. They, they really absolutely. are. Whether it's specifically about diversity or not, exactly. they just it's different. It's different, <laughs> and they exactly. they boy, you see it all over the place. People fight change, whatever kind it is. I, I was afraid of change, but I didn't have a choice. Again, in my neighborhood, and I'm going to say it. We didn't get the choice to decide whether we wanted our neighborhood integrated. It just happened. It just did. And so what, what happened, we learned to accept that. And maybe that's part of our culture. I don't know. Yeah. But we have just, we've embraced it. We, we didn't fight it. But we didn't get the choice. We never had the choice. Yeah. Well, that that can be another conversation that I'm going to invite you back for, for, oh. for that <laughs> dimension. But... You know, for this, you know, change, and, and let's, you know, be, for people who may be resistant to the change that is uh, proposed by this missing middle, I don't want them to feel like they're, they're being uh, marginalized here. 
part of the, the essence of not wanting things to change is maybe liking what you have and right. yeah, you know feeling right. like you know it's 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 worth something and you don't want to lose what's valuable to you so let's let's ask the question a different way have we been able to look at communities that have in the the recent past and i don't know if you know of any examples i'm i'm having trouble thinking of mm -hmm. some off the top of yeah. my head but who have kind of gone down this route of enabling or re-enabling i should say yeah. new housing cool. types because it's not really <laughs> new, new. Yeah. it's re-enabling things that that had subsequently been prohibited but who have gone that route and who have any outcomes that we can speak of um specifically no i mean i know there are a number of like portland mm. and are have gotten rid of california, excluding california yeah. Yeah. um but it's it's been too soon so new yeah but i but i will say this arlington is a community <laughs> that has seen a lot of redevelopment mm -hmm. that has bought value you are not a community that has not had land use changes. Mm -hmm. right. You mentioned Metro, mm -hmm. around your transit ways. Crystal City. Crystal City, <laughs> Crystal oh City under yes. National Landing, as some of them like to call it. We are seeing it right before us. Mm -hmm. We have yet to see in Arlington, let's be specific to Arlington, you all choosing to change density or allow different housing opportunities we have yet to see that result in values going down. Mm -hmm. It has made communities more valuable, mm -hmm. more sought after, has brought more people <clears throat> here to fill jobs that need to be filled, to allow your families to have jobs. Mm -hmm. So I know it's a fear, this property value, but I think those people who bring that up should be required to provide examples where that has happened. Mm. Because I think mm. in Arlington specifically, because of the, ty the type of zoning or, and changes you've made, property value depreciation has not been the issue. No. Uh, that, that is, <laughs> no. That is and no. as a local no. government person, you probably know that better than anybody, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. <laughs> there's, there's, there's not been a correlation for uh, Creating more adjacency to increase density that has resulted in any decreased yeah, land value. Pretty, in pretty darn sure that's so, not that happening. is yeah. so true. Yeah. Believe yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As a homeowner, you know that too. Yeah, that's not the, not the usual <laughs> equation. Just say it. <laughs> yeah. So you know, Shelley, I like to talk a little bit about Reston and sort of the plan nature of that. And again, not to you know have people have in their mind whether they like Reston or not, but I'd love to hear from your perspective, someone who sort of lives there but also has this academic outlook. What's working well about the sort of Reston Town Center experience as it goes through its its multi second generation, so to speak? Well, I think you know Reston was founded with the notion that. Um, community was really important. And Mr. Simon personally detested single-family detached housing. Mm. He, he believed that people should live close together mm. and share common open space. Mm -hmm. So the model of Reston from the beginning has been to cluster people together and then have them share open space. And I think those values have, have pretty much okay. endured over time. In Reston, what we're fighting, the change that we're fighting, is the coming of Metro. Metro, right. It's like, oh, right. good grief. All of a sudden, we have these 20-story buildings mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, um, more traffic and mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's, that's been a challenge. But, gotcha. But the, but the density, the, the idea of, of that clustered density is still very dominant in Reston. Okay. All right. All right. So, you know, I think for many people in Arlington, they would love uh, for us to be able to sort of shape the outcomes a little bit and to deliver some some certainty about what what is to come and we do have a question from one of our residents in Shirlington about whether or not uh, there are things that that can be done to incent or encourage the construction of more missing middle housing so Tracy you talked a little bit before about how sort of the ideal scenario is to construct something where the market's able to deliver. Sure. But, you know, maybe going a little bit more about maybe some of the things that you were hinting at that would then make it possible to come in and if your goals are attainability. Right. If your goals are attainability, let's let's think about, you know, parking. You're going to have to think about parking. Parking, what, you know, if you're street parking, that's one thing. If it's on-site parking, that's another. How much, again, parking are you going to require 
And does how does that impact the billable envelope is one thing. Mm -hmm. um, do you require certain types of materials being built? I mean, again, what I'm saying is there are things that you that sometimes get built into the ordinance that micromanage the outcome of the building that their only value is they add costs. Um, working with landowners to sort of figure out where there might be quick wins to show the variety. Because this is, I mean, the market, you're going you're gonna to have to prove to the market a little bit that you really want to do this and that it's really going to happen. Um, so the initial rollout could be all, all over the place. Um, but the, well, you know, the, the government's perspective, how you talk about it, that it's something you want to see, you want to see more housing options at a specific price point, mm -hmm. will tell the industry what you're looking for and, you know, challenge them to come up with what you want. Just say, you know, this is your envelope, but let's push it a little more. Could you, could you make it so this is the price point? Um, you know, are, you know, what's the difference between rental and ownership um, or rent to own? You know, I, I, I can't express enough to talk with landowner and developer mm. um, and builder, but the, the, with the developer, mm. understanding what they're trying to do. There are a number we're really blessed with in Northern Virginia is a variety of for-profit and non-profit mm. developers mm -hmm. Of attainable housing at a variety mm -hmm. of price points, mm -hmm. you know that's the target of the industry for y'all to go talk to and say, "We want this to happen here. Mm -hmm. This is what we want. Talk with us about what would influence you to do this price point versus this price point." Okay, um, I mm -hmm. think that's fair. It sounds. It does sound fair. I, I just my sense has been um, that. It's uh, the the housing market has been really uh, with the builders and land. It's all for for profit. How much money can we make? Not whether or not this is something that's going to be good right. for the neighborhood or for um, uh, the community in terms of attainable housing. It's really everything has been about the profit. Well, you can make a profit and still be attainable. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I mean, I mean again, it's some like, of them have shareholders. Some right, of them right. are small. There's going to be a, I mean, again, profit is not bad. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know, but it's um, like. But, it's, there are, but there, again, there are companies who deal with attainable that's housing. That's news to me. At a variety, well, they're clients of mine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> at a variety of price they're points. They're just not building. In, the the non-profit ones are building in Arlington, not the. Not, not the for-profit for ones. And, right. and, and again, they're limited in what they can do here with the, with the lack of supply, the supply being so, 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 so tight, right? they can actually get that. And they just kind of take advantage. They, they're right. going to take that opportunity. But with the, the knowledge that there are additional housing units coming on and there actually is a market, because I, I, I agree there's going to be a, such a demand for the missing middle type units for rent or for mm -hmm. buy, mm -hmm. you appeal to that. And again, they're, they just, they're experts in it. It's what they do. It's all they focus on. And that's what they're going to try to look to do. As opposed to a speculative home that they're really looking to sell for a million right. and a half. Right. Well, this has been a terrific conversation. In our, in our <laughs> last few minutes, I want, you know, as we've had this conversation, what you've shared, uh, each of you individually, and what you've heard from one another, just, I would love to hear if, if you could offer just one consideration that you're sort of, left with that that I as a policymaker need to keep in mind as we're pursuing um, you know this this policy initiative in Arlington and certainly I'm not going to limit you to one thing if there are a couple things but just really something that's top of mind for you and I think I I think I started with Tracy in the yeah. beginning so why don't I start with Marguerite to end well well I guess I, I will start with the attainable mm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean really looking to see what the county can do to help make um, um, housing more th that's available, available and attainable. And I, I really have learned something and like what you have just shared about um, 
I had no idea that there were developers that were really interested in, um, I know, making a profit, but not like just um, exploiting in a sense. That's how I have felt. Um, and it's all about the money. Uh, and so I would, I would love for the county to consider some uh, developers that are really interested in working with the county mm -hmm. in terms of making, um, building things that would, would fit with the whole missing middle um, concept and, and policy, and then helping folks, young folks, old folks, afford it. Thank you. And I don't know if the uh, sound of the renovation in the building is coming through for our audience. If not, uh, don't worry about it. But for us, we're, uh, we're, we're going to power through here because uh, I don't know when it's going to stop. So, <laughs> Shelly, how about you? Well, one thing just sort of popped into my mind, and that is that it might be, I'm not sure how this could work, but it would be maybe a good idea if Arlington could work with a potential builder or two to do sort of a demonstration mm -hmm. project mm -hmm. on middle missing housing mm -hmm. um, so that people could see what it means or what it could mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, a model that others could follow. I, I don't know exactly how that would work, but um, I, I think about the city of Falls Church, which changed z some zoning in order to allow cottage housing, mm -hmm. 10 cottage mm -hmm. houses on a very small parcel of land. And people were at first quite freaked out about it because it was a, a real change, mm -hmm. but it's been super successful mm -hmm. and people have grown to be be very wow. pleased with it. So I don't know, just something like that, maybe a demonstration somewhere, mm -hmm. okay. somehow. All right. Thank you. A thought. Yeah, I Tracy. would, first of all, s stick with your guns about ex continuing to examine and talk about this issue of mental housing. This is such an important discussion to have in the Commonwealth because, um, you know, Arlington is significantly way ahead of others in having this discussion. And it's great that you're, the way you're having it, I think, that ongoing discussion, except that you're going to keep having this discussion, even if you adopt an ordinance, there will still be more discussion that the community will want to have with you. And that's a, and that's a good thing, I actually think. Um, and also, try to be as... consistent and constant of where this is going to apply as you can. Go big. Um, do as much as you possibly can because you certainly, your community needs the housing units. Mm -hmm. They need this option. Um, and, I, and I'm hoping everybody who cares about this issue does really sort, accept that this is not an overnight change, but you have to start somewhere. And I also mm -hmm. think we need to remind ourselves that missing middle is not the panacea on attainable housing. There are so many right. other tools that need to be brought to bear, from a financing tool mm -hmm. to being able to get insurance mm -hmm. to learning how to save for a home and, and, and buy one and rent. So please don't put too much pressure on this one tool mm -hmm. because I think I don't want... If you adopt something, I don't want everyone to walk, you know, do this and walk away mm -hmm. because you're not going to solve the issue of attainable housing solely through missing middle, but you're certainly not going to make a significant long term dent in it if you don't adopt missing mm -hmm. middle. Well, wow. <laughs> thank you very much. Very and on that yeah. note, I think we will, we will end. And let me just say thanks to everyone who has uh, joined in tonight by participating via sending in questions. We've got questions that have come in from Sherlington, Aurora Highlands, Dominion Hills. Uh, and let's see, Fairlington, as well as some other places. So thank you all for your participation. And I'd like to extend a special thank you to our guest tonight, <laughs> Marguerite Gooden, Halls Hill, <laughs> Ivy Park resident, Dr. Shelley Mastrin, yes. professor at the Virginia Tech School of uh, Public and International Affairs, and Tracy Baynard, <laughs> yep. senior vice president <laughs> at McGuire Woods. Mm -hmm. Very much appreciate your, your candor, your insights, and just really the great conversation. So as a reminder, tonight's information session was part of a series, and we hope that you will join us again for our last information session on October 12th, mm -hmm. where we will focus on planning for growth. 
and uh, for friends and colleagues, neighbors, or other interested parties who were not be able who were not able to attend us in real time and hear the construction in our building, <laughs> uh, we invite you to have them uh, check this out an archive version, which will be available uh, on our web page. Uh, also available will be housing development and economics. That was the previous information session, and uh, in addition. To these information sessions that we are televising, we also have conversations going on throughout our community uh, throughout the month of October, community conversations uh, where you can learn more about missing middle efforts, but more importantly, engage with your neighbors um, and hear different perspectives about how people are feeling about this on the ground. Information on any and all of that can be found at arlingtonva.us and you type missing middle in the search box. Till then, thank you all and good night. Thank you, that was fun.